excuse me, in sampling distribution. So let's begin. We're going to cover the aims of sampling, probability distributions, sampling distributions, the central limit theory, and we're going to look at a few samples, a few examples, excuse me. So why do we uh, use samples when we think of uh, research? The, and the, obviously, the way that we use samples is in order for us to get a clearer understanding of a specific population. If we are, for example, creating um, market research that is targeting uh, men that are 50 years old that live in rural areas, it's going to be very difficult for us to be able to um, address or <clears throat> survey or interview every single uh, man that is over the age of, of 50 in a rural area. So we use sampling and there is a different, uh, there are different ways to get uh, samples that are uh, reliable in order for us to draw uh, realistic conclusions from those samples. The first thing we have to cover is probability. You know what probability, it's the chance that something um, or a specific situation or something specific will occur. Probability is usually expressed by zero or one. This sounds like computers, <laughs> zero or one. And zero means that it never, there, there is no probability that that will ever happen. And probability uh, equals to one is that it will always happen. Uh, this brings me to think about an example where um, I'm sure you guys have seen it. There's a, there's a, an image that is being, that is going around through social media where it's a chat a WhatsApp chat between a guy and a girl. And the girl says back in 2016, um, listen, I'm not interested in you. Uh, you. I would rather drop dead than get together with you. Give me a call if you're the last man on earth or, the, or if there's ever a pandemic. <laughs> and here we are, 2020. And the guy uh, says, hi. So she should have done her work, her homework. And she should have seen that uh, what are the probabilities that a pandemic will occur? It's not zero. It's uh, more than zero. So uh, let's think of that. Probability, when, um, when we think of probability, the total probability will always sum to one. And there are permutations. So what is the probability, for example, that a family, um, that there will be girls in families of two children? We can see here, and we can see it here represented in a graph. We can see that there's zero, boy, boy, two, girl, 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 and one, where there is a girl, girl, or boy, girl. What about a family of three? We can see here all the different uh, probabilities and represented in a graph. We can see here where zero is boy, 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 excuse me, because it's a family of three, and three is girl, girl, girl. We can see that in the graph, the central is always going to be the highest probability. We can see here, the binomial distribution is that um, the curve. And this is what we consider normal distribution. And if you adjust the scales, it's exactly the same shape. This is what we call sampling distribution of the mean. And it's a theoretical probability distribution that is obtained from drawing the population of all possible samples of the same size. Now, I know that sounds like uh, gibberish, so let me open up this YouTube video for you, which is going to be a lot easier for you to understand. Have to try Monday.com is a platform to track. This is Stephanie from statisticshowto.com, and in this video, I'm going to go over the mean of the sampling distribution of the mean. Simply put, the mean of the sampling distribution is equal to the population mean. In other words, if my population mean is 99, my sampling distribution of the mean, mu of m, is also going to equal 99. It's as simple as that, but I'm going to explain why. Here I have a chart of rolling a dice. Here's my probability of getting any particular number on a dice roll. If I roll a die once, I have a 1 6 probability of getting a 1 or a 2 or a three or a four or a five or a six. This is a uniform distribution. Now the central limit theorem tells me the mean of my probability distribution of the mean is gonna look like a normal curve. In other words, it's gonna take on a bell shape. 
something like this. And there is going to be my mean mu of m. In other words, as the sample size gets larger, my average is going to equal the population average. So for a sample size of one, that's one dice, I'm going to have a uniform distribution. My mean is going to be 3.5, that's one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six, all divided by six equals 3.5. This is my mean, my mu of m for one roll of the die. Now the larger the sample size, the more I'm expecting my sample mean to look like a normal distribution. So I'm increasing my sample size here. Graph at the top, I'm rolling two dice. Next graph, I'm rolling three. And you can see this is definitely taking on the bell curve. If I roll 10 dice, then we definitely have a normal distribution. And I'd set my average for one dice roll. That one plus two. Okay, so you guys can finish watching this video on your own but it's very clear what the normal distribution uh, theory is here. So um, it is going to be the bell-shaped curve where the more, the bigger the sample is, the higher the mean is going to be, but it's always going to have this bell curve. And this brings us to the central limit theorem, which um, this lady has already um, started talking about in her video where no matter what we're measuring, the sample size can get bigger, but if we take it into account as normal distribution, we are always going to have this um, bell curve, and this is called the central limit theorem. So we can see that uh, when we look at um, empirical distributions, they don't have this, this bell, they're not normal, they're not considered normal distribution um, means, like for example, this one with U.S. income distribution from 1992, it's definitely not a bell curve. But the Sampton distribution of mean income, again, it's the distribution of the mean, remember, is, uh, again, a normal distribution bell curve. From when we are looking at these um, different types of sampling and how uh, to, think out, to think about how um, we can read or we can spread out a distribution, we always have to think about standard deviation. And standard deviation is represented in this mathematical formula, but basically it's to what degree um, can we calculate for error or can we believe that the, the samples that we have taken have deviated, that's why it's called deviation, from um, what we are uh, testing. And here I have another video for you guys, because I know that these are difficult um, things to understand. So let me just bring up video. Where is the video? Hold on, bear with me. My computer sometimes takes too long to load, even though I have very good bandwidth. So let's go. There we go. Sorry, guys. Standard deviation, or the square root of the variance, is a measure applied to the annual rate of return of an investment to measure the investment's volatility. Every time you buy a stock or a mutual fund, you're weighing its expected return against its inherent risk. The past gains or losses of an investment are fairly easy to look up but gauging risk is a little trickier. Applying the standard deviation formula will show how much an investment's price has gone up or down in the past and therefore helps in evaluating future outcomes. Take, for example, a security where we analyze five periods of the following stock returns. 2% in January, 7.5% in February, 1% in the next month, 6%, and 1.5% finally in May. To find a standard deviation for a security, find the average historical return, which is 3.6%, and subtract the returns from each month, square them, and find the sum. Next, we divide that sum by the number of observations minus 1. 
In this case, it would be 4, leaving us with a result of 8.675. Taking the square root of that number, we are left with a standard deviation of 2.9. The calculation can be particularly helpful when looking at similar investments in the same asset class. If one investment has a higher standard deviation than the other. Okay, so obviously this video is related to um, investments, but the standard deviation formula is the same no matter what we are what we are thinking of, whether we are looking at investments, whether we are looking at statistical um, analysis, sampling, etc. I actually have left this link for you guys in the vi online resources at the end of class, at the end of today's class. So take a look at it and look at the video link. So here we have the mathematical formula, which you guys have just seen in the video. And here are a few examples. So we can see how um, there is a deviation from the mean. And these are the formulas. I recommend that you guys take a look at it and try to work them out yourselves. And then we can see here, standard deviation and normal distribution. Again, normal distribution is this bell-shaped curve when we are looking at this graph. And then we've got here, the standard deviation formulas. So this we can see uh, distribution of sample means with 21 samples. The standard deviation is equal to 2.02. .02. Here we've got with 96 samples and the standard deviation uh, is 1.8. And here we've got 170 samples and the standard deviation is 1.71. So basically the standard deviation is what I uh, was mentioning before. It's what we are call what we call a uh, margin of error or standard error. And the central limit theorem, which I have introduced in first in the in the first video, basically states that standard, standard error can be estimated from a single sample. We don't have to be testing it from all of the different samples that we are taking. So S is the stamp sample standard deviation and N is the size or the number of observations of the sample. You guys saw in this video that we have to think of uh, how many observations that we've done of the sample and use that when we are calculating the standard error. And in this central limit theorem, we are also including um, we are including the standard sample standard deviation. And then we are also once again, including the number of observations of the sample. And this brings me, this brings me to um, the confidence intervals, which basically states that most samples will fall within 1.96 uh, standard errors or 2.58 standard errors where the knowing that the sampling distribution is normal. So it's again, this bell curve, most samples, 95% roughly of samples will actually fall within two standardized errors, which is uh, something that we can use um, in a general uh, or a, yeah, a general way. So I'm going to stop here. And I will be right back with section two or video two of today's class.